Okay, we're going to restart from here. So, Moses in the wilderness, and they have these fiery serpents, and they've been complaining. And so they get bit. Moses takes his stick, puts the brazen serpent, gold looking, and in the form of a snake. It tells people, you look at it, you get saved. If you don't, you're dead. So it's a picture, ultimately, of faith. Where that we don't see Christ, can't go out, meet him one day, and say, hey, he's my neighbor two doors down. But that we can see that by taking this leap of faith, that we put our trust in Jesus Christ, that he has paid a price for us I could not pay. So the same things happen here in the desert. So that the Israelites are basically saying, I look upon it, okay, I believe that I'll be healed. And they were. So I have to say here a great question that comes out. I say, Bob, how does this death by or sacrifice by wood brings life? Well, we see that Moses had to make this brazen serpent, once again, sacrificed by wood. These people had to look upon it to get a restored life. So you still might come to the conclusion and say, hold oh, here, a brazen serpent. That sounds pretty crazy. How does a brazen serpent associate anything with God? Outstanding question. So the answer to this, I didn't even know this myself. I had to research it to find it. And what it was, is that the brazen serpent was called an anti thesis in this scenario. So what it is is this. What had brought death to the camp? Snakes. So God uses snakes not to bring death but to bring life. So his snake was the antithesis to the snakes that had bitten the Israelites that were bringing about death in the camp. It's like God is the opposite of Many things in life, many things that man does, brings death, war, rape, famine, pestilence, and killings. And God is seeking life. It's a great principle to apply to abortion. God doesn't want abortion, he wants life. That's what he commanded us to do. Go multiply the earth. You might argue that. God says that we've got enough life here on earth. No, God says that he wants us to multiply. He didn't say multiply and tell this and then stop. He told us to keep going. So let's look back. And if you were going to say, put this all in order, we have to go to really the first scene of all. And I guess I didn't. Oh, yes, here, here we go. Can't see it, it's too big. And Adam and Eve in the garden. And when they get kicked out of the garden for sinning, and you might say, I don't know any word of wood that was there, and how is this applicable at all? Well, this is neat, that's going to help tie this all together. Now we see that when Moses, when uh, uh, Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden, God gives them something when he gives them instruction about their life. And it was animal skins to cover themselves. Now what that personifies and teaches, kind of like a type also, is that the animal skins were a covering that was temporary. They would wear out, wouldn't they? And so... God gave them these skins to say, hey, this is a covering for you, but because you now know that you're naked. But it was also personifying our relationship and how it was broken and how we were going to get reconciliation and to make a restored relationship. So scripture doesn't have it stated as an account. We see that by Christ. Christ they say in the New Testament, if all the actions were notated, the bush couldn't fill them of what happened in the life of Christ. So we have this here in the same kind of Genesis. You might say, God gave us the important parts of what creation was about 
and left the rest for us to logically figure out. You might say, hey, that leads to, you know, everybody's own interpretation. No, it doesn't, because you have to really get, it's a logical progression when you get sheepskins. What did you have to have to have sheepskins? Animals. So what almost a predominant inequality theologian would say that the sheepskins came from animals and God did a sacrifice for them so he showed them what they were supposed to do from there on because sacrifice in the Old Testament was only a temporary covering for the sins that they'd done. The longest one lasted a year. So they would have to repeatedly make these sacrifices to show a picture of God uh, seeking his forgiveness. So in all likelihood, God made a sacrifice and showed them put the rocks together and the sticks and, and the fire and we well, have to think here for a second. I thought, where do you think or what type of wood do you think God used in the Garden of Eden? Now we basically have identified the fruit trees. But I think God chose from a different tree to make this uh, fire for this sacrifice. And I believe it was, we only have two other trees identified, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't think so, he told him not to touch it. So if it, he couldn't do it because if he did it, he's kind of like breaking his own rules. But we have the tree of life. So I believe that God took some of this wood from this tree to make this sacrifice. So here we are, we're going to start to get kind of the culmination of bringing this all together. Even though all these scenes, you can say, hey, wow, they're very clear that we can see that most theologians that I've told this to would agree and say this concept is correct. But we see, let's tie this in, this, this sacrifice that was taking place here, and the one with Elijah versus the prophets of Baal. Because I believe that God, when you put together this altar, you put together this fire, it was kind of like a beacon, and you set it on fire with the sacrifice. It was like a beacon calling God down to recognize your actions of this sacrifice. And the reason why I say it is because of the account where Elijah gets it and asks for God to come down. And it sends fire. He didn't do fire with all of them, but he made a very specific account because there were other practices to other gods of sacrifice that God would say, I wouldn't recognize those. So if they hewn the rocks, they were sacrificing to a different God, he could tell immediately because a lot of those are associated by images. Rocks that have been hewn. Okay? So let's go a little bit further and say, wow, holy, holy cow, how about Sodom and Gomorrah? How does Sodom and Gomorrah tie in to all of this? You know, because what it was is that the people in the land were so wicked and evil that God said it was abomination to him. It's like so disgusting that they couldn't live anymore. So Abraham's cousin, Lot, is in this city. And so, see, we see an encounter in Scripture that Abraham talks to God about this situation and tries to negotiate it down that there's 50 righteous people, 30, 20, 10. It stops there that he would not, sac he would not destroy the city. Still, don't really get it. I thought about it. It says, well, there's fire and brimstone that comes down. Well, no, that's not a form of wood either. So how do we get sacrifice by wood brings life? Well, the thing that you got is that the two angels, when they visited this city, they came to look for Lot, and when they had found him, they knocked on the door. Door would be wood. And in this account, it explains where the men of the city wanted to take the angels out and have their way with them wasn't a very nice way with them. 
And so Moses, I, I, I mean Lot, says, no, that's not going to happen. I'll offer some of my children in lieu of that. No, they don't want that. But the door in this instance was the thing that kept the men getting in and getting access to these angels. So we see wood, sacrificed by wood. Lot says, I'm not letting you through this door. He, he basically put up his character and possibly his life to be sacrificed to save these men. We see that in Middle Eastern culture today that some people, if they take someone in, they say, it's my responsibility to take care of them when you're in my household, and I'm not going to let anything happen to you. And so, this is carried out specifically in this scene. So once again, we see wood being carried out in the same specific way. So in all these scenes, we see wood being used as a sacrifice that ultimately brings life. So I wanted to carry it on and I thought a little bit further, how can this be? And how important wood is? Because we ultimately see Jesus Christ died on the cross. And so we'd say his sacrifice by wood brings life. It's very easy to see. But we'd have to say there's other things and other notations that we have in our life to show this wood type also that correlates in a very same way. Let's try when the, in heaven there's supposed to be a book, right? So this book is the book of life. Let's think about it a second. When you have a book of life that's made out of papyrus, we see that predominantly throughout that all the Torah and all the scriptures the Jewish people had that it was made from wood. Son, please be quiet. So, we see that, that wood is even carried out when we see in the Book of Life that there'd be these wooden pages also. Papyrus, thin paper. So we also see in heaven this tree of life. But I also thought, let's go on to a context that we live by every day in our life. And some would say that we carry wood without a, with us many times that shows life. The Bible is made out of wood. Paper makes wood. So I'm using wood to share and learn about life by reading the Bible. But I had one to kind of finish this concept up at all, that finish it up with. There's one example that's found in Revelation, I believe it's Revelation 3.20, where he says, I stand at the door and knock. And if you open the door, that I would come in and I would sup with you. I keep with you. Have fellowship. So once again, we have to sacrifice ourselves to say, I'm going to open the door and let God be the one who dictates the actions that I take. Along with Romans 10, 9 and 10, that thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. God is not just looking to be our ticket to heaven. God is looking for us to be his servants to share the message of Christ with others. So in that scene, Christ knocks on a wooden door that ultimately if we open it and let him in, accept his precepts and choose to live for him, that we will get life for them. So I declare this to be the greatest textual discovery in the history of mankind so that it can put the Old Testament and New Testament, now it fits so precisely that you'd say, I can't argue that this is the greatest themed book ever in history. You could argue 
And let's just push it a little bit further to say, well, Bob, this is just a little far out there, and that knowledge, we're not willing to accept it. We don't think there's a, this any new knowledge. Well, here's my answer to that. There's a couple of things that we see. Scientists, a little over 100 years ago in the early 1900s, says that we had discovered everything there was to discover on Earth. Or they so wrong, right? They got planes flying at mock speeds, monorail trains traveling at 100 miles an hour. We've got pacemakers that when I grew, grew up, you were lucky to have them a dozen years, and now they're basically a lifetime. We see that operations where if you did a triple or quadruple bypass, that was basically a death warrant for you. And now they seem to do it as almost like it's a piece of cake. So, knowledge has grown so much in the world, we all do know that according to Scripture, that God says that He gives all knowledge. Edison didn't invent the, invent the light bulb. God gave him the intuitive sense to create light, and He went about and put the puzzle together and found how to do it. A hundred years from now, we'll probably think of Edison as basically nothing because of all the advances and how we readily accept light without much interruption at all. So we'd have to go even further that they say that knowledge now doubles in the world. You'd be shocked at this, I was. How quick knowledge in the world doubles is every 2.2 years. Doubles. So we're growing in such leaps and bounds, the knowledge. So because of that, when we have all this knowledge, we've seen that there's more higher criticism. Higher criticism, theological sense, are much more that we want to judge the scriptures that they're not correct. And I believe this, without a doubt, shows that the Bible must be the Word of God. You have Word of God is based on three things. One is based on revelation. Revelation means that only a God provided that information. We could not get all this information so complex. We see the Bible was written by 40 authors, 40 some authors over almost 1600 years, and it fits so succinctly. You couldn't get three people to write on child rearing, you know, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. Uh, we used to use a bar of soap and spankings and you know, we call them board meetings and going home with going to bed without supper. And if to do that today, they've got timeouts and use your words and can't be harsh or whatever. Not advocating one or the other, just stating that there's great differences in child rearing. So if you had three different people write about different child rearing, just like a person today, me from the 60s, 70s, somebody from the early 1900s, all three of those wouldn't agree, would they? One would say, you must use a belt or stick to spank them. Another the one would say, oh no, you can't spank. So they contradict themselves so much. The Bible doesn't do that in essence. So please take this, share it with your friends. Why shouldn't we be having a national, as I called it, our nation needs to have a spiritual awakening that men would take up the cause of Christ. I didn't write it down, I thought I did. But I say that we need a revolution, not chew my bang them up. We need a revival. And we need men to take up the cause. Women have done it for a long time. Great that they have. We've seen it's not working. The church is dying. We're becoming unneeded, irrelevant. So we need to change it. God said that he picked the 12 disciples, the 12 guys, and, and guys to go through walls, get knocked down, beat up. As we see with the life of Paul, he was basically beat almost to death three times. And he still goes on and takes on the message of Christ to the world, known world at that time. So it's kind of a different way that men and women do things. They're both great, but just different. 
we see that men, if a man wants to not be spiritual and a woman does, guess what the guy does? Says, hey, honey, go to church, go do your thing. I'm not doing this. But if a man is spiritual, generally that woman will follow that man and say, I want to be part of that too. Because women love spiritual guys because spiritual guys tend to practice, tend to, more right. And that's what women want. Women want protection, security. And when a man is following the ways of God, he is going to more often be right. So that's the thesis and concept that I get and have learned as to why we need men to take up the cause. And I state it in a word that I've kind of made up. And that word is, hold on a second. Won't be able to see this good. I don't have a big black marker. But I say it's like this. We need to take the word revival. Great, my pen's even working now. That we our nation needs a revival pollution. So I'm looking for people to take up that cause. If you're of interest in this. Please tell me what you think of the video, share it with others, give your comments. You can find the videos on youtube.com or my Facebook page, Come On Man, Speak English to Me About God. Let's start this revival in our nation to find the true ways of God. Thank you very much. This is Brother Bob signing out. Best wishes.